we had to move our Facebook lives to Instagram because uh, we were having audio issues with the Facebook once um, more than one person joined the live. So for those of you um, who weren't uh, able to hear us earlier, I'm France Francois. I'm the founder of In Culture Company, and we are specifically focused on peace, reconciliation, and conflict resolution between Haitians and Dominicans. This is this live is part of our series called Summer Schooled, where we invite Haitian and Dominican scholars, activists, and great thinkers to share a bit about what their expertise is, what they do. And our first summer school professor is Dr. Rachel Cantav. Rachel, if you could tell the people a little bit about your genius, that would be awesome. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me, friends. Um, my name is Rachel Kintov. I'm going to get some more light here. Like, you can't see me. Um, my name is Rachel Kintov or Rachel Kintov or Hakeo Kintavi when I'm in Brazil, if any Brazilians are watching. Oi. Um, and I am uh, an anthropologist. I have a PhD in anthropology and specifically my work looks at the relationship between racial identity, uh, religious identity, and social justice issues in Northeastern uh, Brazil. I'm laughing because I'm looking at comments. That's funny. <laughs> um, so, uh, and I'm uh, currently a professor at Skidmore College and I'm teaching a course, um, second year I'm teaching a course on colorism. Awesome. So we had started this conversation earlier. And um, for those of you, I know some people said they couldn't hear us. So we're just going to briefly go over some of the, the main points that Rachel made earlier. So can you tell us, Rachel, Dr. Kantab, <laughs> what's the difference between racism and colorism? Um, so yeah, I'll go through it quick because just in case some of you were listening before. Um, but basically I was saying that racism and colorism are intricately tied. There is no colorism without racism. And if we think about racism as being a way um, in which we understand systematic advantages given to people, also a way of thinking about people, thinking about um, prejudice, thinking about discrimination that is doled out based on race and specifically doled out based in this racial hierarchy where white supremacy is the top, right? Um, mm -hmm. And then blackness and in some cases indigenousness as well are at the bottom of that social and racial hierarchy. Um, so that's what racism is. And colorism is part of racism in that colorism is about that spectrum between that space between um, blackness and whiteness and that people who are closer to the white side of the spectrum then also systematically benefit from um, their proximity to whiteness. And so this is phenotypic, like uh, we can talk about hair texture, we can talk about skin tone and a lot of these things sort of intersect as well, lip shape, things like that, um, as well as other cultural things, right? So. The reason I pull that, I, I said that is because I want to also point out that like once a musical genre, for example, gets closer to whiteness, it's often valued more. So in the case of Brazil, which is where I do my research, right, like samba is traditionally the music of Afro-Brazilian populations. But when it is elevated to Bossa Nova by largely middle class white uh passing Brazilians, it becomes like a globalized and I think the most uh, economically successful music genre to come out of Brazil. Mm, that's interesting because you see the same thing with merengue and bachata in, um, in the DR. As they've become whiter, they've become acceptable, but they started off as poor Black music. Exactly. But we were we were initially also talking about the systemic and structural impacts of colorism in our society, and you had you had uh, talked about some of the you know legal, educational, and class ramifications of colorism. Could you expand on that a little bit more? Yeah, sure. So, like I said, um, if colorism is about getting benefits based on your proximity, your closeness to whiteness, then whiteness as a category is understood to mean, and this is like, this is all historically contextualized, like this is coming out of 
colonialism. This is coming out of enslavement. This is coming out of colonialism. This is also partly supported by religious doctrine, especially in colonial times. Um, mm -hmm. But whiteness is perceived as meaning better, smarter, more beautiful, uh, trustworthy, uh, civilized, and we'll talk even more about that later. Um, so if those values hold firm and therefore blackness equals lazy, not beautiful, not civilized, uh, barbaric, um, then we can think about the benefits that someone gets as being uh, sort of falling into those prejudices that people have. So your closeness to whiteness or someone who um, is lighter on the color spectrum is benefiting from educational opportunity, perhaps because people perceive them to be smarter and teachers pay more attention to them, um, often are getting lesser, lesser sentences, uh, sentencing in terms of um, criminal cases, because they're perceived as not being as violent or as barbaric, right? Mm -hmm. um, also access to economic opportunity or jobs. Um, this is really big in Brazil and also um, throughout uh, other parts of um, Latin America with the idea of Boa Aparencia, which I'm sure is like something like Buena Aparencia. I'm sorry, Spanish speakers, I'm Portuguese, Creole, that's my lane. Um, but this idea of Boa Aparencia, that you get a job if you look good. And so they want someone who looks good for the job, but like the codedness behind looking good is like looking more white often. Mm -hmm. um, also access to marriage, right? So we can also talk about relationships and people's ideas about who's more attractive or who's a viable partner. Um, and also being able to marry someone who might also be higher on the socioeconomic ladder is often intersecting with colorist ideas as well. You know, that's really interesting in that I, I always remember when I started dating my husband, who is Black Dominican, we were both living in Panama. And Panama has a, a very large, very prominent Afro-Panamanian population. And I remember my husband and I went out and an Afro-Panamanian woman approached me and she was like, sweetie, you know, you're really pretty. You could you could marry a white guy. You can marry a white guy. You don't, you don't have to be with a Negro. And she was saying that to me like on some sister love kind yeah. of thing, you yeah. know, like she was trying to help me out. It is, you. Right. And it was such a, a startling uh, comment, but, but I also realized what she was telling me also was that you can give your kids a quote unquote leg up by making them lighter. Like, why would you make, why would you have black kids if you didn't have to, if you're not ugly, ugly, why would you, you know, destine your children to being black? And, and, and I think that goes back to the systematic and the structural parts of colorism, because oftentimes in the societies we're from, whether we're talking about Haiti or DR or Brazil, colorism, uh, proximity to whiteness, as you said, meant they better jobs, they meant uh, being safer, they meant access to education in certain spaces and, and even certain neighborhoods that dark skin couldn't get you into. So like recently, um, you know, DRs had the had a lot of attention for kicking young girls out of school for wearing their hair natural because, as you were saying about Brazil, they're seen as not being professional and not being presentable with their natural hair. And what's that saying is that if you if you want a leg up in society, you have to fit a certain mold. You have to straighten your hair. You have to aspire to that proximity to whiteness. Yeah, and for me, when we think about this, I kind of use it as a way to sort of leave some space for empathizing. Um, mm -hmm. Because while, you know, I can look at colorist beliefs and be like, you know, that's really messed up, that's terrible. Why do we instill this in our children? Why do we say things like better the race? But like, I also can't negate that historically and perhaps even for right now for people, there are true opportunities that people have access to by being closer to white, whether that is in skin color, hair texture, and even more so if all of those things are happening um, in tandem or together. Yeah, and I, and I think that it, um, you know, that kind of brings us to the conversation about whiteness and proximity to whiteness. 
as a state project in Latin America to gain access into Westernness, to gain access into these these white nation spaces. Like it's very intentional that you see that our countries look the way that they look. Like for example, Haiti at one point had the largest mixed race population in all of um, the colonial nations. And after the slave rebellion, a lot of those people left with their white fathers. They went to New Orleans, they went to Cuba, they went to Puerto Rico, where they could continue the institution of slavery. And what I find interesting is that when you look at the Dominican archives, the the census data has like black Dominicans to white 10 to one for much of Dominican history, like black people are the majority. And, you know, it was like mixed race people are like, are like what is like 10 to two black to mixed race. So black people are in the very majority in the DR until Trujillo and more recently uh, the whitening of the state becomes a state project where, you know, they, they remove blackness from the border through violence, through genocide, and they start importing whiteness and specifically importing white men and encouraging them to marry darker skinned women and mejorar la raza, whiten the race. But even in then, have we achieved whiteness? Well, so I'm even going to say that it's interesting to have this conversation um, about and bring Brazil into the conversation, because often Brazil is the place that has done a lot of the things people are thinking about doing. So Mm -hmm. as early as the 1910s, Brazil is interested as a nation state in like covering up this black problem and like they legit have a black problem. They brought the yeah. largest number of Africans over and the population for most of its history is majority, including today. People don't even realize that um, about Brazil. Um, and so as early as the 1910s, people are concerned with like, oh no, like we want to present ourselves in the global scene, but like, you know, blackness is means that we will lack modernity, that we are not civilized. And so one of the ways that they try to deal with the black problem is through, um, whitening, like as in giving subsidies to European immigrants to bring them in and hoping that the mixing of the race will get rid yeah. of uh, the black problem. Yeah. Um, in fact, I wrote this down just because I think I, I think it's interesting and I'm a nerd, but um, in 1912, there is um, this Brazilian dude, let's call him, um, his name is João Batista Lacerda. And he says in a hundred years, if Brazil continues with its whitening uh, project, right? In a hundred years, so 2012, because he says this in 1912, He's like, we will not have any more black people in Brazil. 80% of our population is white. And you look at the Brazilian census right now, and it's like, dude, you were way wrong. You were not worried about that at all. (laughs) And it's it's funny in that, like, you see the the same trend play out in other parts of Latin America. So in Balaguer, um, in the DR rights, that blackness is the, the national stain on Dominican identity. Like, it's something to be embarrassed about and to civilize the Dominican Republic, they need to whiten the Dominican Republic. And those ideas, even though Balaguer left power in the, he only left powers in the eighties or nineties, which is, so his ideas continue to perpetuate. And La Sentencia that happened in, in the DR specifically targets people of Haitian descent, not because they were the only immigrants to the DR recently, but they are the blackest. And they don't fit the idea of mejorar la raza. They don't fit the narrative of mestizaje. So by removing them, removing them from the civil books and removing them from any type of society and pushing them underground, what DR hopes to do is push blackness underground in the DR. Because like now those people can't vote, they, they can't go to school, they can't own land. And what they hope is that if they can't kill them all, They'll, they'll push them all to, to Haiti. They'll just keep pushing them and pushing them and pushing them across that border. 
Yeah. And, you know, Haiti is such an interesting case, too, because Haiti is like ground zero for all people's projection on blackness of like this ideal blackness, the black paradise, if you will. And like so you see so many nation states distancing themselves from Haiti after the revolution as a way of like ensuring their national project of being about mestizaje. We're a mixed race nation in Brazil um, and Colombia and a lot of other places. Right. So like. Haiti in particular, too, is like this sinister blackness. It might be like the place where all of these negative prejudices we have are like projected onto us all the time, um, which is why people who often are not darker pigmented in Haiti um, get in front of the people who are like, oh, you're Haitian? You don't look Haitian, right? right? right. Haiti right. is like ultimate blackness. Right, right. And it, it, what's interesting is that like even in Haiti, in you know the 1800s the our founding fathers struggle with this too there there are a lot of periods of time where haiti tries to you know whiten the race not not physically but by you know pushing catholicism onto people and persecuting Lulizans, you know trying to ban ban creole from being spoken and imposing french on people up until recently you know, it was only French taught in schools because Haiti too was trying to both economically and socially align itself with Western nations because the the struggle our, our forefathers go through is, yeah, you, you want to be this proud black nation, but you also need to feed your people economically, which means you need to trade with these, with these white nations that will only respect you if they think that you're one of them. And I think that what's interesting about that is that the DR, which a lot of people don't know, is the second Black Republic in the in the hemisphere, 1822, looks at what Haiti's going through, and they're like, you know what? Yeah, we're good off this Black thing. Yeah. <laughs> we good. We good. We ain't Black. We Indians. We ain't Black. <laughs> this is just a tan. What you talking about? I just this right. is just a tan. Right. Is, I am right. But do you think that even then? You know, we know that Haiti is never going to be seen as white. But do you think Brazil and DR have achieved Hell white? Oh, no. Can I say that on Instagram? So I'm like, no. I think it's like the greatest the irony of all of this, right? Like, even right now in Brazil, um, the Brazilian president has, like, very forcefully tried to align himself with Trump and, and even got rid of U.S. visas, right? But the yeah, U.S. Yeah. would never do that because the U.S. knows it doesn't want, Bra like, actual Brazilians, non giselle <laughs> Brazilians coming into this country. Like, no, our racial ideas about whiteness are different. So people in Brazil who can sometimes evade, um, like, uh, being of color, like, in the U.S. racial context, people are like, you are not white, okay? Right. You might be brownish, I don't know, but you're not white. Right. So what's the psychological impact of that, though, when you as a brown, as a black person live in a state that is imposing whiteness on you constantly? What how does that psychologically impact people? Um, I'm, I'm now thinking of like the term Indio that's thrown around in in the DR. Does does Brazil have like an, a, you know, something equal to that? Oh, yeah. Like Brazil, like uh, researchers have at one point like counted upwards of like a hundred different ways that people talk about uh, skin color or where they, how they racially identify that has more to do with color. So things like, you know, um, morena, which I know is popular in other places as well. Um, in Brazil, there's the term pardo, parda, which is like brown. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and there are many, many, many others as well. So for a long time, right, to to evade blackness was part of that was also like in your self identity. So regardless of what you look like, maybe you would never call yourself black, and probably you wouldn't want to call other people black because that is offensive. Like you could be trying to offend someone by calling them black. Um, but things have actually kind of changed in Brazil in the last. Um, like 15 years since um, some real racial equality policies have been um, going through things like affirmative action um, and the inclusion of Afro-Brazilian history into school curriculums. And so that's how you know colorism exists is like once you flip the script and you allow some social advantage to black people, 
then all of a sudden people who otherwise did not recognize themselves or self-identify as black are claiming blackness. They're opting in, which is a huge problem Brazil's having with affirmative action right now, that people have seen people who take affirmative action seats and they're like, that person is black. Mm. You know? I, I feel like we, we we're seeing that with Afro Latinidad in general. And we first we saw with the with the natural hair movement, like it started for women with 4C um kinky textured hair to to affirm pride in who they were. And then all of a sudden it's gone to, you know, super wavy, maybe it's it's I don't know, my grand great grandmama was black type of thing. And and you see a lot of um lighter skinned people inserting themselves into black spaces when it's beneficial to be black. Like they're, they're black as long as there's, you know, opportunity and in, into in it and that they get to, they get to come in and out of blackness as it benefits them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's really a problem. Um, I also just want to say, because super crisp, I see you out there. Haiti has the same multiple terms. In fact, one of like the earliest like French writers goes to Haiti and like writes down, records something like 20 yeah. terms for the different races in Haiti, Mabu, Vimo, all of that, right? Um, so yes, Haiti, absolutely same situation or similar situation. Um, but to go back to what we were just saying, um, I lost my train of thought. What were we saying? We're, we're talking about like uh, white passing or lighter skin oh, yes. black people coming in and out of blackness. Yeah. So like that in and of itself is a privilege, right? So I, I, I think to help people understand it, like you kind of have to go back to the race model and white how white people deal with accusations of racism. And that the same way it's like, to opt into blackness when you want to, you're privileged. Because there are people throughout the Americas who never can opt into whiteness and who are never not black, right? Um, right. Which means that otherwise, until you assert your blackness, people tend to still have those positive attributes that I said are a proximity to whiteness. So yeah, it is super like problematic for people to, um, opt into blackness without recognizing that that's a privilege and without talking about color privilege. And I think what's really interesting about being able to opt into blackness is that we can't opt into whiteness. You know, like I have one, one white grandparent and three black ones. I can't go to a Klan rally. Like I can't <laughs> I cannot no. be in white only spaces, right? But someone with one black grand grandparent, you know, there was this this guy who who did his um, you know DNA test, and it came back like five percent, you know, sub-Saharan African, which those DNA tests are problematic in themselves. And then he goes um, in the U.S. He tries to apply for a minority business loan off his five percent. Yeah. And he gets denied and he's upset, but he gets to to just come in and out of what he thinks blackness is as it benefits him in a way that we as black people never get to opt into whiteness at all. Yeah, I think this is why like we have to have to have to start to always talk about colorism when we're talking about racism, because otherwise we like leave a lot of stuff, murky stuff, just like sitting there without like really working through it. You know, um, the way that you are perceived, the way that racism works is often on perception. And then how you are perceived is based on how you look. So you can be politically black, like you can like be about the movement and that's great, regardless of how you fall on the spectrum. But like, you know, the repercussions, the people who suffer the most violence and harm, and it is violence and harm, psychologically, physically, socially, like are the people who are on the darker pigment and darker side of the like racial spectrum, right? Closer to blackness. People right. who can't opt in conveniently to make some money. I saw someone reference pop star Anita with two T's if you want to Google her in Brazil. When she wants to braid her hair and have like cool points like for her favela video, like that's cool. Mm -hmm. But you know, otherwise when she wants to present herself in a particular way for the US Grammys, it's like blowout, right? Right. Like, honey blonde highlights. 
Right. So yeah, right. we can't have yeah. a conversation about colorism with racism. Right. And I think that that's really important as, as we were talking about earlier in that you, you see a lot of lighter skinned black people um, saying like, hey, hey, there are no dark skin, dark skin people in this room. Where are the where are the dark skinned women? But they aren't giving up their seats at the table to allow for darker skinned women and darker skinned people to have a voice. So this idea of speaking for darker skinned people or even taking up space that's meant for darker skinned people for me is really, really problematic. Like if you if you're really politically black, um, then you you should use whatever privileges you have to make sure that the most vulnerable amongst us are are at the head and, and the most vulnerable amongst us are usually dark skinned women and darker skinned and queer people. And you hardly ever see those people at this with the seat at the table. Like Zendaya will say like, oh, you know, there aren't enough dark skinned women in movies, but she'll never be like, oh, give Viola Davis this role. I don't want it. Right, right. Yeah, no, I think it's like not enough to talk the talk. Like there has to be actions. Um, if you have privilege and therefore you're able to get through some doors, you gotta open that door wide and like literally let your sisters in. <laughs> like literally be like, girl, come on, come on through. Right, right, right. They ain't looking, come on, girl. <laughs> right. Um, so how does the myth of mestizaje act to make people more vulnerable in societies for not looking mixed enough to belong? And I and I saw someone pointed out that um, even in Latin America, our perceptions of people are different. So someone said that in the DR, our uh, Brazilians are perceived as white in comparison to Dominicans. Mm -hmm. So how does like those of us who don't fit those stereotypes of what you know, someone's supposed to look like in those spaces, how does that impact the way we move through our societies? Yeah, so I think there's two ways that it impacts. And like, first, let me deal with the side. I hear this a lot when I am teaching this course from people like, when I was growing up, I wasn't black enough. People didn't think I was like really Haitian or whatever it is, right? Like, and those are, you know, people's traumas and that happens often. I think there's a lot of policing and surveillance of blackness. Um, but what's more sinister than that, because, you know, then you assert your blackness and people accept you usually for black. But what's more sinister is people like specifically Dominicans who are perceived as being Haitian and then are brought like deported across the border, right? Like these are stories that actually often happen too to like Afro-Mexicans, for example. So I love that you said like in Brazil, in DR, they see Brazilians as white, right? So mm -hmm. I've heard Afro-Mexicanos say that like they're perceived as being Cuban because Cuba mm -hmm. is like the black part of right, the right. So, Like depending on where you go, right? In Puerto Rico, like if you're a little too dark, they might be like, oh, you're Dominican, you're not Puerto right. Rican. Mm -hmm. So like wherever you go, these perceptions about blackness change, which is why it's important. And we mentioned it, I think on Facebook, maybe not here, um, that each, each country has its own racial ideology and context for understanding these like, you know, uh, racial categories. Um, and but that it can be really harmful because when national governments want to remove people who do not belong, it's always the darker skinned people, right? Mm -hmm. It is usually darker skinned people who are in harm's way and who are ostracized ostracized or excluded or can kind of be swept under the rug. Even in the U.S., when we talk about U.S. immigration, we never talk about Black immigrants and their struggles. Um, the narrative is, is mostly focused on brown, quote unquote, brown uh, Latinx people. And those struggles are absolutely 100 percent important. However, like it causes the invisibleness of dark skinned people. Yeah. And you know what, what's really interesting? I, I was working in Haiti uh, after the earthquake and um, a lot of these new hotels were built. And at one point I was staying at the, the new Best Western in Pétionville. And for those of you who aren't Haitian, Pétionville is um, a suburb of Port-au-Prince. It's a very well-off suburb. And it was initially a suburb meant for um, light-skinned Haitians. And still to this day, it's it's very much an enclave of light skinned, uh, light, lighter skinned Haitians. And so um, I was staying at, at the Best Western and they opened up a new bar on their rooftop. And so I'm coming from a long day of work. Um, 
And a friend of mine who's also Haitian and very light skin was like, hey, I'll meet you at the rooftop. And she had gone in, she was waiting. And then I go up to go up there and the security guy is like, no, you can't come in. And I was like, why? He's like, we don't want you, your kind here. And this, I am Haitian, born in Haiti. And he said, we do not want your kind here. And at, at that point, I switched from speaking Creole to speaking English. Mm -hmm. And I said, what, what is my kind? Mm -hmm. And what was interesting about that, as soon as I switched languages, he was like, oh, I'm so sorry, whatever. But my friend who was light skinned, she walked in, she had no problem getting in, nobody stopped her. But in Pétionville, there's a there's an idea of what kind of Haitians belong in that space. And, and other Haitians, darker Haitians are policed. And in these spaces, in these these there these restaurants, these bars, these establishments, there are a lot of stories of darker skinned people being turned away mm -hmm. because they are seen as not belonging. When you know that's just it's really interesting to see. Like even in the Black Republic, we are still fighting colorism ourselves. Yeah, absolutely. And you bring up a good point about how class and color are so intricately tied, especially for any nations that um, went through slavery, right? Um, and so like you can watch a million videos that will talk about like the difference between people working in the fields and houses. But what I wanna talk about is to say like, so in the way that we think about class, when we think about people who have money, often again, it's like on this spectrum where proximity to whiteness can mean that you are higher class. And so like that's mm -hmm. a kind of like economic or class passing that can happen in a place like Haiti, right? Yes. Where you can like fake the right. funk because yeah. you're a dreamo or you're light, right? right. Like, um, so yeah, there's a lot of, and the same thing happens in Brazil. I can't tell you how many times in Brazil people will be like, oh, where are you going? Or what are you doing? Um, mm -hmm. I've had horrible experiences based on color how people perceive me and then when i speak english right oh it's totally different yeah right right Completely right different story. right um, yeah we could have a whole other podcast about passport privilege and the privileges that come with speaking english in these spaces but i think it's also really interesting in, in how colorism plays out in the dr in the denial of dominican blackness so you know well i'll have well, and we do our workshop, we'll have, you know, dark skinned Dominicans come and say that I am always, my Dominican identity is always questioned. I always have to prove that I'm Dominican in a, in a country that everybody looks like me, but my Dominicanness is always questioned. Whereas like the white Dominican never has that. So I have like dark skinned Dominican friends who've had their family members like picked up while they're walking home or whatever. And or just for identification. Right, just dropped in Haiti. Like with, you know, and, and they're like, figure it out. Like you, you gotta be Haitian, you're black, you're Haitian, you know, figure it out. And you know that that in itself is problematic, and that like as the the state polices, you know, this myth of mestizaje, it it means that that people that look like us are constantly experiencing violence, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And to go back to what we were saying about intention and outcome, that's a place where intention and outcome actually allies. I don't think the state <laughs> is all that like torn up about the accidental black people that they're expunging in this like you know what i mean in this violent way like real talk like they probably don't care because it does contribute to it does contribute to the final goal which is to whiten the nation state right you know there was a, a really interesting comment someone had made not not any of you guys on this chat because you guys are all super woke you follow icc so i know you're good but um someone was like well you know, lighter skin get people get jobs and go to school because they're smarter. That's why. And I thought that comment was interesting in that, like, you know, recently I've been reading through some like um, very old um, books on on Haitian history, and one of the things that have, has come out um, is that so there were, you know, there's the there was the white planter class, but there was also their children, their mixed race children that they had. And some of these people, they left land to their children. And with that land meant that they also left enslaved Africans to their children. Sometimes it was their own like mothers and siblings that were enslaved. And so there was an entire class in Haiti and in the DR, and I'm sure in Brazil as well, 
of white skin mixed race people who owned slaves and therefore were able to they were able to write books they were able to go study they had that time to be leisure and educated because they had somebody else doing the, all the hard labor for them and you see that passed on through generations it's very it's intentional that lighter skin people have more access because they've generationally had more access like the you can't undermine the the economic um you know opportunities that came with having an entire class of people that were working for you and let me just say that doesn't mean that all you know light-skinned people own slaves but there that just means that there was a significant in both haiti and dr slave owning class made of mixed race people who passed on those opportunities to their offspring throughout generations and those generations remain in power now in both countries yeah absolutely i mean i don't have anything to add because you just said it <laughs> that's how it works <laughs> yeah so how does colorism play a role into how we empathize or who we judge worthy ah i so i think this is an aspect of like colorism that we don't pay enough attention to um because there's a way that right if proximity to whiteness is valued subconscious subconsciously even right like we uh, feel more empathy towards like whiter people or people who fall on the lighter side of the spectrum than people who fall on the darker pigmented side of the spectrum. So like I was thinking about it today because I was reading some articles about that um, the New Jersey judge who didn't uh, who didn't press charges against that boy who raped a girl because he said he was like a good guy and like had a great yeah. education or future, right? Yeah. So, and one of my, my cousin actually, uh, Gino, my cousin Gino said, you know, like it's crazy the way that they can see empathy for these white men, but like there's no empathy for black men when it comes to sentencing. And mm -hmm. I think that colorism happens in a similar way where there's like so much empathy for like, uh, people who are light skin and their issues and like way less empathy for people who are darkly pigmented in their issues. So like, you know, for example, when that Oprah dark girls and light girls came out, I remember when light girls came out, there was like so much like, Oh, it's so hard and people da, 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 da. and not to like, you know, I know I did a voice not to <laughs> minimize that. It is like, you know, colorism, it works that, light-skinned people are made to feel bad sometimes. However, however, they had how many celebrities on the light girls documentary? Mm. That's because light-skinned women prevail in media. In the dark girls, I think they had two. They had like Viola Davis and like maybe like a little bit of, I don't, I don't even remember. There you go. I don't even remember yet. Like how many really darkly pigmented women do we see in our media? And so I think, you know, when we talk about colorism, when we're talking about power, we need to also be thinking about empathy and how, why we always are quick to like empathize with people who are already in power through the system and really try to refocus our energy towards empathizing, holding that door open, right? Allowing a voice for the people who, are most marginalized in these systems. Yes, yeah. You know what was really interesting? Um, a really interesting aspect of colorism that I have seen playing out right now is in um, mainstreaming African-based religions and music. So for example, right now, like, you know, Haitian music has been put on the map by um, Michael Blanc, by Jay Perry, by artists like mm -hmm. Miska, Mm -hmm. uh, by, um, what's her name, Ravel, all mm -hmm. very, very light-skinned Haitians. And whereas the, and this this also goes for bachata, for merengue, for mm -hmm. reggaeton, for dimbo, yeah. for all, all these other music genres that were, that were started and popularized by darker-skinned people, and, but have been made mainstream and monetized by lighter skinned people. And that's not to say that lighter skinned people have no role to play in our religious and musical traditions, but it's really interesting to see when those traditions are deemed um, acceptable. And I really wanted to see um, and hear from you, what do you think that does, well, like how, do, how does that impact the black communities that kind of held, held those traditions down, like held them down? 
Yeah. Um, so I have several thoughts. I guess I'll answer your question, but there was something I wanted to say about that as well. Um, it's not coming to me. Um, so, you know, it's it's really harmful. I mean, it's, it's part, again, of this, like, invisibilization of um, darker, pigmented people and their contributions to things. Um, and when I think about, I, I, I don't remember if I said this on Facebook, like the proximity to whiteness is what allows something to become popular or acceptable. And also if we talk about, right, like power, like there is real harm, there is real like repercussions that darker pigmented people probably feel in doing something as stigmatized as no no veneers but stigmatized as african traditional religions um mm -hmm. and so you see this happening not only just like all the haitian artists that you mentioned but i think of ebay Yi. um i think about uh also in brazil many of the ashe artists in brazil um when people start talking about um candomblé and orishais in brazil a lot of those artists um, in the 70s and 80s are white artists from northeastern Brazil. So from an area that has a high population of black Brazilians, um, except that they are able to, and I do feel like it, it is like able to, they're able to talk about these things with less repercussions um, than a darker person would have been able to. Um, and so, and it allows for the violence that happens against these people, right? Because if we're focused on um, if we're focused on like people we consider to be attractive, feeding us things that are stigmatized, then it allows for violence to happen to the people we're not focused on, AKA people we don't think are attractive, right? Mm -hmm. um, and to go back, and now I remembered what I wanted to say to you is specifically in Haiti. I remember when I was growing up, my parents are like big compa fans. So like we would listen to like Tabu Kompo and Jakut and everything. And um, they always said that like, there's a saying in Haiti that like, if you want your compa band to be popular, you put the light skinned guy in the front, whether he can mm -hmm. sing or not, right? So like the kind yeah. of yeah. Love you, Kali, <laughs> but you know, you too. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you see the same thing with bachata artists and merengue artists. Like it, it's the lighter skinned person put out front, even though these were black musical traditions mm -hmm. that were started by black people often living in poverty. It's and been it's empathy again, too, right? Like, like there is real violence like in Haiti and especially in Brazil right now, people are ransacking people's sacred uh, spaces of worship. People are like beating up people in the streets. People are calling them devil worshipers. All mm -hmm. of this stuff, really harmful, violent things, right? Mm -hmm. And yet like this popularization doesn't stop the violence because mm -hmm. we're too busy like pulling our interest towards these lighter central focuses and cute versions of African traditional religion to be focused on the real violence and harm that's happening. Right, yeah, like when I was working in Haiti, many times often you would see missionary groups go and actually destroy Vodou temples and build churches on top of them. They would say that the only way children could go to school in a lot of towns was if they converted to their version of Christianity. And I say their version because I don't believe a lot of those people practice Jesus's version of Christianity. Um, and so you see this violence against voodoo Islam's promoted, but then on Instagram and social media, there are all these people monetizing these beliefs who are lighter skinned and removed from that violence without thinking about the consequences that darker skinned people are, are facing. And I see somebody here mentioned reggaeton, um, and Plena and Panama, uh, which is a place that's very close to my heart. And what, what an interesting story, a little sidebar I'm going to share is that when I went, uh, we were living in Panama, Maluma, the Colombian artist, came to perform and they were going to pre present Maluma with an artist. So all the Panamanian Plena artists got on stage to present Maluma with this award. And if you've, you've seen Panama's reggaeton artists, they are all dark-skinned Panamanians from, from the hood, from the hood hood. And 
Maluma refused to come out on stage because he said he was scared to be on stage with those people. Maluma, who is making money now of reggaeton, of a genre of music that was started by dark-skinned people in the ghetto, refused to be on stage with dark-skinned people who had made it out of the ghetto. Why and am I surprised? I'm, I'm not, but ever since then, I tell everybody that story. So if you guys see Maluma, give him a side <laughs> eye. Um, Maybe don't. Don't right. him. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> um, what role do, have white people played in maintaining colorism? Because oftentimes we blame each other. There, There's all this like light skin versus light skin beef that, that was going on this week. There's light skin versus dark skin beef. But what what have white people done to maintain colorism as an actual institution? Yeah, so, okay, so I said it in Facebook, I'm gonna say it again. Like, often when we talk about colorism, the first thing people say is like, colorism is something that's like within, it's like airing our dirty laundry as black people. But like, I really push against that because white people are engaged in colorism, y'all. White people are the gatekeepers often, especially in like throughout Latin America and the US as well, right? Like. Who are the people, who are the teachers who are providing more attention and privilege to lighter skin students that they think show more uh, opportunity or intelligence, right? Like who are the people who are pushing policy in these nation states who say like, oh, you should pull over everyone who doesn't look like they're Dominican and ask for identification. Like white people are also engaged in this. Who are the people who are deciding who are on our magazines and in our television? Like in Brazil, it's not black people deciding that. I know that because they make like slave period epic telenovelas and then Sorry, white, white is an essential character, you know? La Esclava Blanca. <laughs> yes, yes. So white people are absolutely engaged in this as well. It's also part of the reason why like the sexualization of uh, the mulata for in Brazil, I'll just use mulata even though that's a, problematic word but like that's part of the reason why right like sex tourism and this idea that like brazilians carnival queen has to be mulata she can't be too dark if you google that online you can find a video about a woman who won globaleza which is like uh one of the television networks like samba carnival competition and they revoked her her throne like they revoked her as being the queen of carnival because they said people said she was too dark Mm -hmm. um, and so white people are absolutely engaged in colorist thinking and colorist practices as well. Um, so we shouldn't lose sight of that. Yeah. And I think it's, it's really interesting that you, you brought up the, the mulata because like that, that began with the, the mulata concubine that a <laughs> lot of white men kept mixed race, um, women as concubines and that that stereotype has shifted to the spicy Latina, um, you know, the Sofia Vargas, the J Lo, and to also to video girls. So, and it's all it, as you mentioned, it's also it's white people in power that maintain those stereotypes. The stereotype has evolved, but it's not black people who are making money off mixed race women. It, it's not the black artists, often males who are, you know, the rapper in the video, they're not usually the ones picking the video girls who are the let or promoting these Latina stereotypes. So a lot of times these these stereotypes are imposed on us and we unintentionally keep going with it without questioning what power structures are in play and like who who is seen as worthy or who is seen as attractive or who is seen as being able to be put up out front as the face of whatever this thing is representing. Yeah, I think the mulata and the sexy Latina too, or spicy Latina is is also really deeply tied to our sexist thinking. So I think there is sometimes like not even a subconscious, like there is an activeness that men of color play in perpetuating that stereotype because of their investment in gendered stereotypes, mm -hmm. whereby white women, right, are pure, are beautiful, are graceful, and then black women are wild or overly sexual, right? Mm -hmm. And so to mix those two things is to bring like the, the sexual prowess 
usually like body, right? So like in, in samba, the mulata has the big butt, and big thighs, right? Um, and then mix it also with like the demure valuation of like white woman's beauty or white features, like, and, and to make those two things in the middle ideal, right? Um, and so, yeah, like absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. Definitely. And then I think what it, also the way it plays in, in our societies is the, the advent of sex tourism. Like sex tourism is huge on the island. It's, mm -hmm. it's also huge in, in Brazil and in, in Haiti, in the Haitian context, the way I've seen it play out is it's a power structure in that white men, is, and it's usually white men who are either the UN troops or their foreign aid workers or, or whatever, who will use that position of power um, to have black women in a position of subservience. And, and then in, in the DR, you see too a huge advent of sex tourism and, and child sex tourism um, as white guys, and it's usually white guys and sometimes African-American guys go to the DR for this idea of, of the, the spicy Latina and things like that. And then I think uh, it has a really interesting impact on our communities as, because it promotes violence against women. Like as we devalue our women more and more, it becomes easier and easier to put them in harm's way. So even though both all three actually, DR, Haiti, Brazil, are very much aware of what these guys are coming to the countries from for. Mm -hmm. They don't, they're not stopping it. Like then, and then you see the, the bodies of women show up, like DR has the third highest rate of femicide in the region. The Dominican government isn't stopping that because it's using Dominican women to, you know, push its economy in a, in a way. Oh, yeah, not in a way. Like, that's what it is. Like, the same thing for Brazil as well, right? Like, the continuing of this, like, mulata as being, like, the central figure of Carnival. Carnival is, like, one of the biggest revenue bringers into the nation um, through tourism for Brazil. Like, the nation state is making money. It's making money. And I think um, often people will take what social advantage they can get so we don't even interrogate it too much, right? So some people might even feel like, oh, well, I'm flattered, like I'm sexy, right? Um, because I'm the mix of all of the things without thinking so much about, like you said, all of these outcomes, all of these like really dismal and horrible uh, things that happen to women of color throughout the Americas and children. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, I think there was there was someone in the comments that said that uh, she also sees the impact of colorism on her sons, and and we often say, we often talk about women when we talk about colorism. We talk about Latinas, we talk about mulatas, um, and mixed race women. But how does colorism impact the men in our communities? Right. So in the same way that I had talked about uh, women as being so if the way that gender and color sort of intersect right so if if white women are the ideal in terms of beauty and purity right and then blackness equals like sexual virility but then the way that we understand masculinity ideal masculinity is about being more aggressive more assertive right that's where you get people uh, that's where you get this sort of inverse relationship where darker skinned black men are hypersexualized mm -hmm. um, because it aligns with how we think about ideal masculinity. Mm -hmm. um, but that also said, right, like that's two sides of the coin. People sometimes when I like be like, yeah, you know, I'm dark skin, I'm Idris, everybody loves me. But that's the mm -hmm. same stereotype that makes police officers feel like you're a threat and that they mm -hmm. can shoot. Right. You know, what's interesting about that, uh, you know, I was sharing with you earlier, I didn't realize how I was playing into to that stereotype and, you know, like, like making fun of, you know, like, oh, you're acting like Drake, like, you know, those, those things um, that play into this idea that lighter skinned men are somehow less black or, or weaker or, you know, or emotional, all right. the problems we attribute to women. Exactly, or or we attribute to people who who were in the house instead of the field. Like they're not strong as strong. They're not able to withstand things. So even when the, when we're saying like, oh, I I prefer dark skinned men, or you know, I like my black brothers, or whatever. What what sometimes we're unconsciously saying is that 
I, I stereotype lighter skinned people as being less than black, like less, they're less masculine. Absolutely. And the, the inverse works too, right? Where like dark skinned women are often seen as being too masculine, too aggressive, not too aggressive. Bad. Yeah, <laughs> you know? Um, so it works both ways as well. Um, yeah, and I think though, with men, there's a little bit more leeway though, however, um, because it's, it's while we talk about women and someone just brought up preferences, so now it's in my head, but when we think about our sex and dating preferences, right, um, the most important thing for women historically through sexist patriarchy is like for us to be beautiful, but like, a man can be valuable, even if he's not attractive, especially if he has money. Mm -hmm. And then there's ways that, again, access to economic wealth and class has followed along lighter skin color uh, uh, throughout like Latin America. And so there's a way too uh, that while dark skinned black men might be like the ideal, the sexual, ideal sexual mate, they might not be the ideal person to marry. And that goes mm -hmm. for women as well. Right, right. And, it, and, you know, I think the comment about is that really a preference or are we subconsciously saying, you know, I am trying to give my, my child the, the best economic and social opportunities by mm -hmm. making or trying to make sure that they're light? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I mean, I don't believe much is preference honestly I, I mean guys i'm an anthropologist so like it, for me it's like ev we've been socialized to understand everything we're seeing at all points in time whether it's familial culture whether it's national culture whether it's community culture class culture like all of these things that we believe they didn't just come from nowhere we didn't just like pull them from deep inside of us right like we've probably been fed these things through media images through the things families say we didn't talk about families but families are like oof, to get the conversation about color is a messy like families are often the sites where you see like the push for colorist thinking to be so I, traumatic really right like the mm -hmm. pinching of noses the treating certain children in the family better than others um like these are real things that happen in brazil in haiti in the u.s in the dr and so we have to have to also talk about how to deal with colorism within the family and i don't think there's not a good answer like i hope no one thinks i'm going to give them the answer i i can't give them the answer. i was going to ask you that <laughs> <laughs> You know, I do my best to push people on why it is they say a certain thing. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of times, like, people just say, like, oh, that girl's so pretty, isn't she? And I'm like, why? Because, you know, like, that auntie always says it about someone with lo looser hair. Mm -hmm. And they're like, oh, just look at her. And I'm like, but what about her? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, you, you so, like, don't I look sort of ask those kinds of questions. Or I might you know, Haitian culture, it's like you can't disrespect elders. So I like really kind of traverse the line and people often are like, oh, Rachel, you went to school and now you think you could talk to us however. And I'm like, oh, that means. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, yeah. But no, I think it, it's really important because I've, I've uh, you know, I, I do this with, with my, my husband's family sometimes when, well, they, when they'll say things, I'm like, well, why'd you say that? And they're like, oh, because, and it, and then, and I'll keep asking why. And then slowly it'll be like, well, because he's black, friend, he's black. And I'm like, well, there, yeah. there it is, right? There it is. I you mean, know, part of it is like pulling it out of the shadows. As long as right. colorism is that dirty secret, no one wants to talk about, we can't do anything. So like, right. first of all, need, like people need to come out of the shadows and be interrogated about these things, especially around children, especially mm -hmm. around children. We often think like, oh, kids aren't seeing race until later. I'm going to wait. I don't want to mention it. And oh, it's like, I no, no, no. Kids see Instagram, it Instagram is about to cut us off. It's giving oh. like a 20. Yeah. So oh, okay. <laughs> I'm going to log off and, and just start over another live sorry guys i didn't know lives had uh limits <laughs> sorry um we hit the live limit last time so we're just going to bring rachel back and uh wrap up okay
Okay. Hey, okay. So apparently Instagram said we talk too much. So, um, you know, I w would love if we could wrap up and think about how we address colorism. And we kind of started to touch upon that a little bit, but if you could just give us some ideas for the audience about like how we start to address these things in our, in our personal lives and in, in our society and our system. Okay. Um, so first I'll just go back to what we were just saying. Like we have to interrogate these comments in our friend circle and our family circles when we hear them. Um, it's tough to speak up. I know, but like you have to, even if you do it, like I do in a passive aggressive way where you like question people on why they say colorist things. Oh, that's just my preference. Like, but why, what is it about that? You know? Um, I think as a kid, a lot of times people like talked about racial mixture in a way that was like, oh, like I'm mixed with this, so I'm mixed in that. And then I remember in college, someone was like, you know, a lot of mixture in Latin America and the Caribbean is due to rape. And it was like, mm -hmm. you know, that moment of like contextualizing, right? right? right. The things that we do. Um, yeah. So that's one. Number two is our lighter hued, uh, sisters and brothers and non-binary people, you have to, have to, have to uh, recognize the existence of colorism. You need to pass the mic. You need to allow for other darker pigmented people to have the spotlight when it comes to issues of colorism and allow us to voice our grievances. It just like, just like racism doesn't happen if white people don't interrogate white racism, like same thing for colorism. It doesn't happen if light skinned people don't acknowledge that this is a real thing that is happening um, and act as allies. Um, and then I think also, and I'll close on this, is a big part of this is about educational reform as well. So, so much of our national identities are tied into uh, ideas about color and race. And so I think it's really important for us to be critical of and maybe push for uh, different types of curriculums that teach about Black or African contributions to our nation states in Haiti, in DR, in Brazil, especially, right? And not just that like black people brought culture and music um, and like textiles, but that there are valuable contributions of black people historically and contemporaneously in all of these societies and that therefore blackness is valuable, duh. Right, right. It's interesting because someone someone asked me uh, in the comments like how they should how they should deal with anti blackness in their Dominican family, and I said, well, you know, talk about dark skinned Dominicans that that you admire, some Dominican hero, and she said, I can't think of any, and that was a really powerful moment um, in just thinking about how the state frames who are leaders and who are. Uh, and frames the nation around. Like, it's not that there haven't been dark-skinned Black Dominican heroes, it's that they are intentionally left out of the national narrative of who, who is Dominican. And, yeah. and I'm sure it's the same in, um, in Brazil. So uh, I know you have to run, but this was amazing. Um, I don't know if there are any last minute thoughts or things that you, you can add, but just to reiterate, your points on how we address colorism. You said that, you know, light skinned people need to step up and recognize that it exists and that their darker skinned um, relatives, families are being treated def differently, that we have to do a better job of interrogating our language and our decision making. You know, yeah. like it's not a preference sometimes. No, Right. And we pass the mic, pass the mic to our, our darker. There's whoever is darker than you pass the mic okay look around and say like you know what that person that person needs to be here that person needs to be part of this conversation um and educational reform like our historical narratives in our country the way history is taught to us push this idea of who gets to who deserves to be 
part of the nation, this myth of mestizaje, this, oh, somos una mezcla. I hate when people say that. Like, no, we're not all mixed. Some of us are just regular schmegular black. Yeah. Regular schmegular. And that's okay. And that needs to be taught and um, brought up as well. So thank you, Dr. Rachel Cantav, for blessing us with this live and I, it's been just a wonderful experience talking to you. And, and thank you for everyone who's, who's ch- chimed in on their comments and on their thoughts. And this live will be saved so that you guys could, can watch it afterwards if you didn't get to catch it from the beginning. So thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Thanks so much. No, you were awesome. Let's do it again. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye.